Okay, well welcome everybody to our uh, April webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about data collection and analysis at General Motors. We've got Dave Reiber with us who is the Global Maximo and PDM training lead there. So uh, he obviously knows what he's talking about. I actually got to meet Dave last year at our Ultrasound World Conference. Um, and uh, we were actually hoping to have him speak this year. And uh, unfortunately, he had uh, some other engagements. So we're hoping to get him back down there next year. But uh, this is the type of great information we were planning on having him present. So uh, those of you that won't be able to join us, um, you're going to get the benefit of hearing, hearing what what kind of information we will be sharing in, in just about two weeks now at, at the conference. So uh, just another good little sneak preview here. So just real quick, um, you know, UE Systems, we've been around for over 40 years now providing um, ultrasound technology throughout the, the globe. Um, we've got support offices um, all over. You can see the list there on my screen. Um, and we really are, are proud of the, the customers that we've got, like Dave, who have really taken hold of, of their program um, and really are, are making the most out of not only, you know, going out and collecting the data, but then, of course, doing something with it. Um, so it's not always as obvious and as, as easy as it sounds. So uh, it's great to get some lessons and hear some best practices from, from some of our power users like, like Dave and the folks at GM. Um, if anybody's interested in a little bit more information about UE systems, our products, software, um, any of the education that we provide, just pop a note to me in the question section and I'll be happy to send you one of our interactive guides um, just to give you kind of everything you need to know um, with just the click of the mouse. Um, so you can do that. And uh, before I welcome Dave officially, um, just some housekeeping. So. Uh, we are recording this and we will put it up on our website uh, in just a couple days and I will email all of you once that's available. So if you have to drop out early or if you've got colleagues who uh, just couldn't make it, they'll have that opportunity to watch this on their own time. Um, also, we do have the questions box, so please feel free um, throughout the, the webinar today to type in questions and I'll get those over to Dave and, and uh, we'll try to make this as interactive as we can with all of us you know, spread out uh, throughout the world. So uh, we try to do the best we can and uh, with that I will toss the screen over to Dave, so just give me one second here and uh, let him take it away. Okay, hey, thanks Maureen. I appreciate the intro. Um, as Maureen said, my name is Dave Reiber and, uh, and uh, uh, I talked to uh, folks at uh, UE uh, World last year about uh, uh, all the different things that they were doing at the uh, conference. I really enjoyed that. It wasn't just ultrasound. It was really about the holistic look at, um, at maintenance and how to be a reliability-centered uh, group and I really enjoyed that and so of course we discussed about uh, sharing some of the things that we do. My presentation is more around the requiring or getting data from several areas and our particular areas are in Maximo and, and then a thing that we uh, call PM and C and, and then you know just any other place we might gather data to make good business decisions. Um, we do uh, use ultrasound in several of our sites, and we do a lot of good things with that also. But um, this presentation is basically going to be around data and making decisions with that data. And so I appreciate that. And also, um, and uh, uh, Doug has also promised that uh, one of their guys would uh, help me with one of our webinars. We do uh, frequent webinars here at uh, General Motors for our folks, and uh, it would be great to have uh, one of the UE experts talking to our folks about how to use the tools and what's new and what's going on in their world. So uh, I appreciate that also. So put this in presentation mode and get going. Okay, so required data and required analysis. I, um, I've, I, I've often talked about this, but I didn't really present it until two years ago. And, and most of this isn't really new information. It's, it's information from two different uh, presentations I've done for like uh, Maximo and, um, and for other predictive uh, things that we've done. But it's all around um, if you require data from your masses, and when I'm talking about masses, I'm talking about the people in your organization, 
whoever they be, if they're engineering, if they're your technology group, if you're production group or whatever it is, make sure you're gathering it for a reason. Make sure you're gathering it for the reason to do analysis around it. And that sounds like you're preaching to the choir when you say things like that. And people go, well, how can that, you know, why do you even say that? It's because uh, most of us who are doing this uh, for a living understand that, and I don't remember what the numbers are, but it's significant. It's like 70 or 75 percent of all the data gathered never gets looked at. So when I talk about required data, I talk about required analysis. In other words, we should appoint somebody to actually take a look at it and then help us make good business decisions. We're all, uh, you know, um, a product of our environment, and our environment's talking to us all the time. So a little bit about me before we get started. Um, uh, I did get my CMRP recently uh, from uh, you know, SMRP. And uh, I'm global training lead for Maximo and global predictive maintenance lead. My background is in electrical construction and, and industrial electrical troubleshooting. And I've done lots of positions at General Motors, including skilled trades supervisor and general supervisor and site project manager for Maximo, a couple different sites, and our North American Bi Maximo business lead. And then participate in the IBM Advisory Council for Maximo Development. I've done that for lots of years. I've also was elected to the Manufacturer User Group for Maximo, um, and that's an IBM group also. And then also I've done a few webcasts and videos around uh, different things to do with Maximo and business development and process, common process development. For me, this is really, really important that you have a common process with common goals and objectives. So the gist of this and the meat of this is better maintenance decisions resulting in reduction of cost. And I think when you talk about that, you have to really talk about what does it really mean to you? And what is a cost burden to you? A lot of folks, when they start talking about reducing the cost burden, they talk about headcount, they talk about spare parts, um, they talk about you know process and systems and all those different things. You really have to describe what that really means to you as a group. And your organization may take a different recipe than my organization. In other words, if we all take two aspirin and a glass of water, you know, it's not going to work for all of us. Next thing to think about is raising the skill levels of your employees in the use of information technology. As we all know, technology is growing so fast and changing so fast that what we did a year ago is old news. So what does that mean to you? So who are we training, how are we training them, and when are we training? How often are we updating their skills, etc.? That's a very, very vital, important piece of data excuse me, of data gathering and data analysis. So the next step, and I think this is really important, I call it beginning with the end in mind, and I give credit to Stephen Covey because I didn't come up with that by myself, but beginning with the end in mind about what data will be needed for analysis. Decide which reports are used in each level of your organization. In our case, it's SPQRC, which is just a common uh, overview of, of uh, safety, people, quality, uh, responsiveness, and cost, and of course environmental is in there now. And then, you know, business process, operation reports, problem solving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there will be many, many things that you do at your site that are different from site from other sites, but try to decide which of those are most important and at what level they are important. And then if I'm going to ask the masses to collect that data, I need to make some decisions around, you know, where is that priority level. So look at your system requirements and your business process requirements. When training your users and your leadership, always make the relationship between the data collection and the finished reports. I can't stress this one enough. When you're looking at gathering data, if you tell someone, for instance, on a work order collection screen that there are 50 fields, and I'm only going to require you to collect data in eight of them. And another person collects data in 12 of them. And another collects in 11 of them. The, the, the reports are going to not, are, if I went site to site, the reports are going to be very different. They're not really going to be very usable. The other side of that is, if you're only doing eight of the fields and the person who's doing 12, they don't just get four more reports the report base will grow exponentially in, re in relationship to the fields that they gather. In other words, if you're gathering eight and you're only going to get 20 reports, the other person's gathering 12, 
they might get 50. So it's very important that we understand what data and finished reports are tied together. Of course, if you look at bullet five, when they see what's in it for them, I use with them a lot, that's when you get buy-in. It's very difficult to tell somebody, I'm requiring you to do 15 fields or 18 fields on a work order if they don't see what's in it for them. Again, never assume that you don't need certain data. Rather fault on the side of too much at first. You can always cut back. You can always analyze and adjust data requirements. Remember, you cannot do strategic analysis of data you didn't collect. So a takeaway on this page, link people to the training and link data fields to reports. It's very important. I know it sounds kind of basic when I talk about it, but I can't tell you in my experience how I've seen it just doesn't happen. So I have basic rules. And my basic rules are when we talk about all employees agree that all events that affect the maintenance organization will be captured. Well, that doesn't mean they have to be in, in our case, we use the, the Maxwell system. It doesn't mean they have to be in Maxwell. They could be in several of our other data gathering pieces of, of, of systems or processes that we use. Work order required data must be established, trained, and measured for compliance. And when I talk about that, remember, you only get what you measure. We're all really busy these days, and if you're not measuring it, you probably aren't going to get it. The third bullet here, key performance indicators and the reports to support them are aligned with the work order required data. Again, when I talk about work order required data, I'm talking about, in, in our case, particularly in Maximo and some of the other systems we use, what fields are we requiring you to put data in? Now this is just a busy page and I won't cover all of it. I, I, I highlighted a couple of things I want to talk about. I have to go through this process with myself sometimes about where is data required and used and I have to ask myself some questions. So what drives a process? And we got to look at output capability. What are we actually capable of and what are we really after, right? Remember I said begin with the end in mind? And then of course what drives the output? In our case it's goals and objectives. We set the goal and objective early, and then we decide how we're going to get there. You need, so next thing I've highlighted is improve, what drives improvement? Measurement. Remember, if you, don't measure it, if you don't measure it, you're probably not going to get it. It's kind of like when you're, when you're leading a group of folks. If, if you don't give your expectations up front, you'll hit that target every time, as they say. So what drives measurement? Strategy, right? If I'm not getting the, the uh, improvement that I'm looking for and I'm measuring it, I have to strategize how to get there, how to get to the next level. And what drives a strategy? Success or failure, right? That would make me change my strategy. And what drives uh, success? Decisions. Making good or bad decisions based on the data or lack of the data sometimes, right? So what drives decisions? Analysis. And that gets to what we're really talking about here. If you're not analyzing the data, you should expect not to get you know good results. So, collecting data. What I'm finding in in my experience, and I'm not just talking about General Motors. I'm talking about across the business, across the manufacturing and maintenance business. I see a lot of pockets of excellence, but I don't see very, or I should say, I see very few total site coverage. So I see folks that are great at getting breakdown data. I mean, they'll go on and grab data on a breakdown. They'll come back. They'll put all the information in the system. They'll take the spare parts, and they'll document all that and the costs. And, and then when that's all done, they'll go about doing irreversible corrective action or some kind of engineering change to make sure it doesn't happen again. And I, I have to take a look at those systems and say, wow, you guys are really great at breakdown. You know, but then I have to ask him, so how good are you at PMs, and then how good are you at predictive maintenance? And, and usually, if somebody is really great at any one of these, they're not as great at the others. It's rare that you'll find that the talent is spread across all of them. So then you see the next one here, great at getting optimized PMs established. When we first started down the PM uh, road at General Motors, we just, I th think that we thought that the numbers, the greater the number, the better we performed. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case. And if you're really into um, 
optimizing your system today as we have to be because we have less people and we have less time and we're making more product. So we have to optimize the PM and uh, and and so instead of having 6,000 PMs in the system, I might have 2,500 good PMs in the system. When I say good PMs, I mean PMs that really hit to the bottom line. Remember, we can't be doing anything that doesn't result in a return on investment. The other thing that's a, that's a big pet peeve of mine is great at scheduling. It's, this is a very difficult one, in my opinion, because that scheduling resources is directly related to those other gold bullets or gold nuggets and laying around the room. You know, are you good at doing root cause? Are you good at doing breakdowns? Are you good at optimizing PMs? If you're really good at those things, you're much better at scheduling. So I, I think the scheduling is, and it's the hardest thing to get nailed down. I don't know how many on the call are familiar with the Maxwell system, but they've recently added a scheduler. That scheduler was developed from several uh, Companies input, including General Motors, about how important it is and how it should be established. It's difficult, in my opinion, to do this right, but probably paramount to your success. Let's look at the next one: graded establishing condition-based monitoring of critical assets. I think this is most important um, in relationship to this call and the folks that are on here because it's really what we're talking about in uh, in this world. Condition-based monitoring or gathering of uh, uh, what I call listening to assets is probably really, really important as we go forward. It's the one piece of General Motors that I'm trying to, my personally, to grow harder than ever right now, and that is to get us to be a better listener to our assets. And then great in handling spare parts. To me, this is low-hanging fruit, and it virtually, if you not keep your eye on this one, it's always there, and it's always money to be gained. So this is kind of a, a spider chart that we put together on a, the work order system. And I say, what are reporting requirements? Okay, first I have to ask those questions. And how do you know you're getting the data? So this is an example of how uh, work orders in the Maxwell system, for instance, um, digest and work on and are linked to all these other applications. So uh, if you're not familiar with Maximo these days, there's 34 modules and about 118 applications. And that might be a little different, but that's the way it was when we first came out with version 7. And so having the information linked to, if you go around that heart, the work order heart, you'll see locations and work requests and fair codes and labor and crafts and calendars. And by the way, those calendars are very important to scheduling, condition monitoring. Um, job plans, safety plans, hazards, um, inventory, purchasing. All these things have to be linked to your work order and that work order has, to, has, has the ability to gather all of that information and put it in a way that we can make great decision-making reports out of it. And I've listed a few of them on the bottom of the page. So you see compliance, mean time to repair, mean time between failure, backlog, life cycle cost, and safety regulation, regulated uh, reporting. These are extremely important. These are pretty basic type reports that most of us do in one way or another. But those reports can all be left high and dry if the masses aren't putting in the correct data, which is really what I get to and really what I'm talking about, the meat of this uh, presentation. And that is putting in the required data. So this is just an example of what that could look like. Whoops, jump forward there. This is an example of what that could look like. So work order required data is identified to assure appropriate data is in the system to fulfill reporting requirements. And so this is, in this case, off the work order tracking screen, we picked 15 fields. We're saying the work order number is important, the description is important, the work order priority number is important, and the location and or equipment priority number is important. Equipment number or location is important. Well, that's listed twice. Reported by is important. Who is the supervisor uh, assigned to the job? The date and when is it modified? The physical location, the failure codes. We require failure codes on all on all emergency maintenance work orders, by the way. 
And when I talk about failure codes, I'm talking about the class of failure, whether it be electrical, hydraulic, mechanical, whatever it might be, and then the problem, cause, and remedy that go with that. Our goal always is to get to component failure, but you can't get there if you don't have the data. Actuals required on all, all work types at close, estimates required on all PMs, maintenance-related downtime, and capture contractor data hours. So if I'm working with a contractor with my own folks on some kind of a, a project, I want to make sure I capture the whole story. I would like to go back up to um, number three and four, a work order priority and location slash equipment priority. Again, this is part of my scheduling uh, pet peeve, if you will, and that is um, you cannot do proper scheduling if you don't have these two things. When you're putting in assets in the, in the system, they have to be listed as highly critical, critical, normal, or run to failure items. And in the maximal, we identify that with a number from 9 to 1. And I know it's going to sound backwards to some folks, but 9 being the highest and 1 being the lowest. And so I would have to put that asset in, that, that equipment priority number, at, at wherever that lands. And let's just say it's a high priority number. It's a very important asset in my process. And then when there's a work order assigned to it, as soon as you pick that asset, it's going to let me know right up front that it's a high priority or highly critical asset. And then I would assign my work order priority in relationship to that. And I want to just say a quick example of what that might look like. Let's say, for instance, that you're on the um, um, assembly plant in a, in a manufacturing area, and you're on what they call the pay line. In our case, it's where you build a car or truck and it's going down the final line. There's a water fountain next to the column, and the water fountain works fine, and one day it springs a leak. All right, That leak on a water fountain is not going to affect scheduling quality on my product. Right? So that work order, so that uh, asset, that water fountain, might only be a two or a three in my equipment priority list as far as criticality goes. But if that water fountain creates a big enough leak and starts leaking across the aisle where people are walking and assisting in the build of our cars and trucks and it becomes a safety hazard, now that work order priority number is going to shoot to a 9 as soon as it becomes a safety item, right? And even though that asset is a low priority, it's going to push it up the schedule to fix me now. So that's why these two are very important. Hey Dave, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Real quick, if you can go back to that slide, we had uh, someone who had a had a question. They just want a little clarification from you before you move on. Yeah, no problem. Um, in regards to uh, number twelve, the actuals are actuals the comments for repair work, or are the actuals the completed data measurement? Is what they're asking. in this case actuals. And if you're reporting actuals and maximal, what this is alluding to is how many people, what skill set, and how long, right? And spare parts, by the way, and how much they cost. So when I'm talking about actuals, I'm talking about did I have two people on the job? Did they spend two hours on the job? Did I have to check out a special tool out of the crib to fix it? Did I have to um, uh, buy spare parts that cost a lot of money, et cetera? And that's what the actuals refer to. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Great question. I mean, those are the kind of things I think are vitally important. I mean, I can't put my holistic uh, maintenance plan together if I don't have that kind of information. Okay, so this is an example of what that looks like on the Maxwell screen. And this is not meant for you to be able to read it. What it's meant to uh, show you is that these fields are all over the place, and it takes some specific training to get to a level where people can really be comfortable understanding what's going on here. I think it's really important that um, when we're training, and we do this in our team, when we're training Maximo in our case, we're making sure people know what these fields are. And there's also some error proofing you can put around this as you put your system together by either um, only showing screen or fields that you want or putting highlights or color coding behind them, etc. I can't say at this time that we've done a lot of that, but what we have done is taught 
our folks what those required fields are. In this case, if you look around that screen, you can see it can be quite busy. And if you look at the top of the screen, you see there's several tabs. We're on the Work Order tab right now, but you see next to Plans, Related Records, Actuals, and by the way, if you were going to do the Actuals where that question was just asked, you would push that tab and you would see what uh, that, that's linked only to the actual timing, people, skills, etc. that I talked about. And this asks me for safety plan, there's a log report, a failure report there if I'm doing problem calls and remedy, etc. So busy screen. I can't expect that someone would, by divine intervention, figure this out on their own. I would have to go into the screen and teach them exactly what I need in order to have the reporting common across General Motors. And this is how I would do it. Busy, but necessary. If you look here in the uh, middle, third way down the screen, middle right side, you see that what I was talking about before about asset priority and work order priority right together, right above each other. You'll see there's an asterisk next to uh, priority for the work order. That's because that is a required field. And that's, a, that's a system required field, which is my next point. Everybody's system has system required fields. And I don't remember what it is on Maximo, but I think it's like, five, maybe, are required, well, that's not going to give you very good reporting, right? And so if you looked around that screen, anywhere where you see these asterisks, and they're, they're, this is, a, I know, an eye chart, but we see work type here, sub work type, you see the priority, um, there's an asterisk. Wherever you see those asterisks, those are required. But we obviously, in order to do the kind of reporting we do at General Motors, we're going to have to have a lot more fields filled out than just those. And by the way, in our case, Maximo uh, self field, uh, seeds many of those fields based on selections that you make. In other words, if you select this location, and uh, it'll automatically fill that in. And you know, if you select this asset, it'll automatically fill in that description, those kind of things. Okay, and so and then this is an example of the same thing on preventive maintenance. So this is a PM screen. And I'm saying the same type of thing here. I'm saying uh, these are the fields that I would require on my PM screen. Um, you could add more if your particular site uses some information that someone else doesn't. But across General Motors, I would say this is what you need in order for us to run our business. And again, these are, this is actually from some time ago. And as our business needs change, I would expect that these change also. So kind of summed up here, having one piece of accurate information is worth a thousand expert opinions. And you see that came from Grace Murray Hopper, Admiral in US Navy. I always like to bring this up. I think that people make assumptions many times on emotion. But we know that uh, one piece of accurate information is really what you're looking for. So, required data should be established and taught. Maximo screens can provide examples of accurate information which would be useful in running the maintenance business, but only if we do that. And again, remember, you cannot do strategic analysis of data that you do not collect. Typical challenges of maintenance and reliability. Again, preaching to the choir here, and I'm not going to cover all these, but reducing unplanned asset downtime, increasing throughput. To me, if you stand on the soapbox of throughput and safety and schedule and quality, you cannot go wrong. So predict asset, predict asset equipment failures effectively and accurately. It's called precision maintenance in all in language today. But we can't be precision predictors if we don't have the data. Anticipate product and process quality problems. You can do that with data. Optimize maintenance cycle and costs. You can do that with your data. Probably most important the, uh, thing to remember here in optimizing maintenance cycle costs is understanding what you're going to do with the asset to start with. Is it going to run for six months, six years, 16 years? Is it going to run one shift, two shifts, three shifts? It's very important that you understand that before you start building the plan. We, in this case, we have limited IT resources. And we have limited capability to analyze asset data. So we have to teach people what we're looking for. Are we looking for people who know how to analyze asset data? You better believe it. 
and it's a, it, it's a skill set, in my opinion, these days. And then, do you have a disconnect between the IT and the business? I think that's kind of common. Uh, it's way better today than it used to be. But what we have to do is make sure that when we make a request to the IT business that says, you know, I, I need to have these fields or I need to understand this reporting piece and that we don't fight about it, but we understand it's a business requirement and then make sure that it happens. And then I have some more just examples of what business process required data can look like. So in this case, um, this is one of our vibration analyzers and we're talking about you know, uh, pump and motor combinations and uh, pump and coupling combinations. In that case, we're showing laser alignment. Um, in this one, you're just showing a bunch of screens. And of course, uh, we use this data in conjunction with other data. We might use vibration data with the ultrasound data. I saw a great presentation last year at UE World that demonstrated using the vibration data in, in relationship to the ultrasound data and they laid those over each other and did some strategic analysis. We, we are not there at General Motors today, but we're working towards it. I really thought that was a great presentation and, uh, and um, getting your, I can't stress this enough, getting your um, technicians who are trained in infrared, vibration, ultrasound, etc working together on the same problems and confirming finds one way or the other just makes your whole system stronger. Um, I try to do that across General Motors wherever I can. We lost a lot of people um, through uh, retirements and, uh, and through our uh, you know, rough times a couple years ago and so uh, we're building the system again. But it's vital, I think, that we cross train each other and understand where we're coming from and then, uh, you know, help each other out in making diagnostics. This is an example of a basic start center off Maximal. And this is the kind of thing where if you were at GM, you might log into your Maximal screen. And on the left side, you see some favorites, just like you would on any kind of an internet application. You know, this is my favorite. So if I wanted to quickly go and insert a new work order, I could click over here on the left side and do a new work order. If I want to insert a new PM, I could do it here. If I just wanted to go to the application, the work order application, I could click on it here, down, and then, and then if I wanted to go to quick reporting for like a breakdown or something, I could click there. On the right side, you see um, different types of work orders developed, or excuse me, in a just a pie shape that shows me where they are. Um, very hard to read, and um, that might be by design. I have to get I had to get all this approved by legal a long time ago, <coughs> and uh, so. You see what kind of craft and uh, and uh, you know trying to see what that is. I just can't read the whole thing. I'm sorry. And then you see below uh, to this next one. Here's one that shows a a graph in place of the pie. In this case, it's showing uh, numbers of work orders and type of work orders. Again, I think these are basics. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> a basic start center can have a lot of things on it, but what it really is a, a I'd say specific to a person. So in this case, this person might be the type of planner and scheduler that works in an area that's specifically looking for, well, what work orders do I have in my area that I need to take care of? This next screen is something more in depth. For those who are familiar with Maximal 7, you see I have first at the very top on the left, the total number of work orders. And then the next one underneath it, the graph one, they're broke down by type. On the right side, you see a result set, and that result set is a query that's, that's specific to a particular need that this person has. I built something like this in relationship to um, um, water pumps, and so I selected every water pump on the site, put them into a result set, and sorted them by area, and then you come up with a uh, result set that's specific to that person, and this person might be a person who's in charge of anything that pumps water on this particular site. This is an example of an adjusted select statement. When you're doing these uh, charts uh, for your start center, you can adjust the select statement. And uh, of course, I've got part of it covered up there on purpose. But the example of an adjusted select statement for specific information. What's great about this is if I'm 
building these kind of queries and I'm putting them in a saved query area, that you don't have to build it tomorrow or next week or next month. I can share these with you. I can go off and we actually have what we call a SharePoint site where we share these with each other. So if you're at a different site than me, you just have to go in and change the site idea, ID and you might have to change some, some dates or whatever and then you can use these uh, select statements also if you work at General Motors. Here's another example of a start center setup for overall management of the Maxwell system. So this might be a person who's never going to write a work order, but they need to understand where the system's at when they come in to work in the morning. And so they're looking for just specific information. Here's another one. And this one I built specifically for a site manager. This guy I knew for sure was never going to write a work order. All he wanted to do is see the general atmosphere of the work order uh, <clears throat> system when he comes in and logs in in the morning. So he's going to look at it and see, you know, do I have any safety work orders that are open? You know, is there any critical equipment that's down or has been worked on recently? Those kind of things. And this way they can come to uh, site very quickly and they can go out and address those issues. This is an example of a monitoring system screen. We have a system called PMNC, and in this monitoring system, it just gives me an idea of what's going on out there. And um, <clears throat> if I can, in, if I can look across my system and I can say, you know, I've got upper and lower parameters set, and I can see where my trouble spots are on this monitoring system at any time. Here's another example of a monitoring system screen. In this case, it's showing me uh, main drives and standby drives or backup drives on my conveyor systems. And it shows me, you know, um, 0 to 450 hours are green, 450 to 800 hours is yellow, 800 hours is red, and what we're doing is we're cycling those and, and working through making sure that uh, our systems work and our backup systems are ready. Here's an example of an alarm screen. And all this does is I've set an alarm, an upper or lower limit, and in this case the alarm went off and said that I've got an issue. I'm not very clear on a lot of these on purpose, um, and that's just part of the way I have to do these when I do a, a webinar outside of General Motors, so I apologize for that. Not being really clear on those, but that's what I have to do. <clears throat> okay, so getting through all the examples, um, and I'm getting back up to 50,000 feet, feet here, and, the, and just going to talk about what that means to me. Predictive asset value and ex extends life, right? The business value estimate and extend component life, increased return on an asset, optimize maintenance inventory and resource schedules, improve my quality and reduce call recalls, reduce time to identify the issue, and improve operational effectiveness. So that's really what we're looking for here, but we have to establish that business value up front in order to know what data I'm going to gather on the backside. Just a couple, like I said, high flyers. The world's becoming increasingly complex. Supply chain, aging workforce, customer demands, raw material prices, compliance and scrutiny all affect what we do. Poor asset performance is the things I can put my arm around as a maintenance guy. So when I look at that, I look at my, my columns and middle column. You know, High cost of unscheduled maintenance, inability to accurately forecast asset downtime, result in an unnecessary process proliferation, and aging assets pushed to limits that need to meet customer needs. All of those things I have to think about from a uh, maintenance perspective. I only put this one in there because I think this is really important. That whenever we make a decision in the three main asset groups, it affects the other two significantly. So if it's a physical asset, a people asset, or methods or systems, they all affect each other. Remember when I talked about remo reducing cost burden, if I just remove people, but I remove the people who are the best systems and process people, or the best trained predictive science people, right, then I've got a problem. If I remove physical assets, I have to make sure that the methods and systems and processes I have in place work with the new assets and I have to train people to the new asset. So I only use this example to make sure that we talk about and understand that every decision that you make, whether it's in the physical asset, the people asset, or the methods and systems, 
affect everything else around them. So I think it's, and I won't list all of these, but I think it's really important that uh, we talk about what that means. People should be treated as an asset and measured to their personal impact on production capability. Sometimes we need more people, more training, more predictive capability actually to reduce cost burdens. Sorry, I'm hearing somebody. But remember here, our goal is to reduce costs. So here's my roadmap to begin to be more data driven. Begin with the end in mind, paint the big picture first, focus on problems worth solving. Identify information that must be analyzed, establish where that data lives. It might not be in the system that you think it is. Who is responsible for it? In other words, assign somebody to analyze it. Understand how this data can be captured effectively. Design a plan to turn those insights into action. Get it into the business meeting, the business that will boost the bottom line. Ensure analytics isn't a siloed function, but it's integrated into the broader business. Enable a cultural shift to analytics-driven decision-making. Abandon making decisions based on gut feelings or instincts. This is what we did in the past. Investigate and invest in technologies, right? Recruit and retain analytical talent. Remember, I can't stress that enough. Not everybody knows how to be really good at analytics. It actually takes some, some time in the saddle to understand that it's not just the immediate data you're looking at. You're looking at trending and patterning. Ensure the analytical groups are aligned with your business team and focus on the business objectives. So key takeaways. Data is a challenge, but it is also your opportunity. You're not alone. These challenges are not insurmountable. Show people the value. Remember, show what's in it for them, and they'll come back to you with their suggestions. Get some wins, and then expand your data analysis. Always be thinking ahead of your competition and leverage analytics to drive your business decisions. This last one I think is really important. And I think it's important that we think ahead of our competition always. I'm not the last person who's going to ask, well, what, what's someone else doing or how are they doing it? I'm, I'm interested, but it's not going to stop me from being in front. And I don't think it should stop you. You should always be thinking about how am I going to be better, better, better continuous improvement. And that's it for me. Uh, that was on my last slide. So I guess I'll take uh, questions. All right. That was great, Dave. Thanks so much. Um, I did have a question here, and obviously, folks, please feel free to, to keep typing them in, um, and uh, we'll run through these. But uh, one question we got was, talking back on, on the work order, um, how do you ensure work order history reporting is completed completely? Um, I guess this individual sees a lot of, you know, job done or, you know, not, not really filling things out exactly the way maybe you've asked that they do it. So what's, what are the steps you take to, to get that done? Okay, great question, an absolute perfect question, actually, because that's, that is a big problem. Two things here. Number one, it takes constant um, um, overview. You really have to be checking to make sure that that's happening. And you can pull a report, in our case, out of Maximo, to show which fields are being filled out and which ones aren't, and link to work orders. So that's important. But one of our folks actually uh, uses the Start Center. Remember I talked about doing result sets. One of our uh, managers has figured out how to show on his result set um, how many work orders are not getting the required data filled in. I just really like that. They can come in in the morning and actually take a quick look and say, geez, you know what, over there in the body shop, they decided not to fill out these fields. And then you can address it that way. But it is something you have to stay on top of. All right. And just a kind of a clarification point for um, one of the questions we got. Um, you know, obviously, Dave, you guys use Maximo, so that's where all your examples are coming from. So this this webinar wasn't a Maximo training webinar, it's just that's what you nope. all just happen to, to use. So yeah. if there was some confusion about that, that's just uh, that just happens to be what, what Dave uses. So uh, anyway, right. just wanted to clarify that. Um, now, kind of speaking about, you know, of course, again, you're using Maximo, but a question came through. So for anybody using a CMMS, um, do you have some advice on, on how you all 
um, attach the data that you receive and, and that you run through um, with your ultrasound equipment through you know our software and and putting that um, those reports back then into your CMMS do you that seems to be something some folks are interested in if you have some advice on that or, or at least just how you guys are handling that well there's two ways we do it number one we attach our um, our uh, software or excuse me our reports to our work order system so if we're going to schedule a work order that's uh, related to uh, ultrasound uh, work for instance will attach it as an attached work to that work order. And I don't know if you're not if you're probably not familiar with Maximo in this case, but there's actually a library for attached documents. And you, what would you do is you put it in that, that library and then you can attach any of it to it and that's how we do it. You don't have to do it that way. There's actually a tab in Maximo that allows you to collect condition monitoring data and enter it there. But it's not as uh, I'll say as complete as is you would uh, attach the document. So that, that's how we do it. And we can do it both ways and we do it do both ways. But if I would want a whole a better report, we would attach it to it. And we do this with IR also uh, and with vibration also. We'll actually attach the, uh, the report from that software, from that particular predictive science, and we'll attach it to the, uh, the, the maximal work order. All right, great. Um, and just you know, another question. Obviously, you talked about at the beginning, and then again towards the end, um, kind of that value of of doing the WIFM. You know, what's in it for me, and and trying to get folks on board. But um, any other suggestions for for really pushing this forward and really kind of finding those you know quote unquote cheerleaders along the way that are going to help help with with this kind of a program and and keeping things going and improving and and taking things to the next level. Well, there's no, uh, there's no, well, how should I say? There's, there's no blue or red pill here that's going to cure it. The thing you have to do here, at least I found, is um, you have to make it part of the job, which is part of the issue. Say that it's required. But on the other hand, what I find is some of the folks who were most against gathering more data rather than less once they saw what's in it for them, actually started seeing the reports that came out and they made the connection, they became the um, evangelists for pushing it forward. In fact, some of those naysayers became the ones who wanted to teach the new guys the value. And uh, I think that's kind of why I always go back to that, revert back to that. Because um, I, I was kind of the same way in, in my past life. I was a skilled tradesman. And, um, geez, I don't have time for that, right? I fix stuff, and I build stuff, and I don't really have time to go out there and collect data and put all that information in there. And I really don't, you know, but if, I, if someone showed me how it might keep my job around longer, might make my job worth more, it might show my value in a lot of different ways, then it changes. And I think that that's probably why uh, that's how it's worked for me as a leader in the past few years, making sure people understand the value and relationship to them personally. That's, but there's no easy role. Yeah, I think that's great kind of taking that shift because I think you can run into that, you know, oh geez, the more data I go out and collect, the more problems I might end up finding that are just going to make more work for me, um, but kind of flipping it the way you just suggested and, and really looking at it on the more positive side. And of course, looking at your last bullet point here about, you know, staying ahead of the competition, this is clearly one of those ways to do it. So I think that's uh, mm -hmm. some great sound bites there. Um, another question that came in just now, um, someone's wondering if you have any suggestions for connecting data, um, so from the different predictive technologies you've talked about, and creating an overall summary of plant health um, to share with leadership. Is that anything you've got some, some advice or feedback on? <laughs> you know, I wish I did. I that is absolutely what I want to do and exactly what I think we should be doing. But, and I could tell you we have pockets of excellence there too. I could name a couple of our GM sites that are doing a really good job of doing a comprehensive um, predictive activity and preventive 
activity and emergency breakdown activity to make the whole picture. But I can't tell you that that's across the board. And uh, I wish it was. And it's certainly a goal. But I don't have that answer today. We are really working on that. And, and um, there's actually a team at General Motors working on um, making it look more like a, uh, you know how you see a dashboard type effect. But, but that's, again, it's just things that everybody's working on right now. And I just can't tell you that we're all doing it, but it is absolutely the vision. Well, and I, I promise one of our attendees actually typed that in, but it does, that question does kind of tee it up nicely for me to mention that we, we do have um, one of our pre-conference workshops um, at our Reliable Asset World Conference, which is taking place at the same time as Ultrasound World, is actually on kind of taking all the different predictive technologies tying them together and finding a way to make them, you know, work together, complement one another, and, and really um, achieve, obviously, overall, you know, plant health and, and asset health. So um, that's something you guys can look forward to. And as Dave mentioned, with one of the topics from last year's conference on connecting vibration analysis and ultrasound, we've got all those recordings of, of different presentations like that that we've done, you know, up on our website. So um, anyway, that... That, that was an opportunity I had to take a swing. Um, so yeah. one more question here that came in. Um, have you all had success recording calibration data or at least pass fail results in Maximo? Well, that's an objective question, but yes, absolutely. And again, another pocket of excellence. And I can think of one site in particular that has uh, really taken that to, um, to a um, next level. Most of our problem solving teams on the predictive side of the house are involved with um, um, highly critical asset problem solving, not just in their office, but at the uh, uh, operation meeting, you know, where someone's saying, you know, this it, it, it could be an emotional event, right? That something is a, um, uh, a sporadic breakdown issue and it's become an emotional issue and I think it's really important that we go and look at it um, objectionably and say you know what we've got the predictive science information we've got the preventive maintenance and we've got the emergency maintenance information to me that's the best way to do it and some of the folks um, have really used the condition monitoring um, and meter activity inside of Maximo to capture really good data and they can bring that data in in relationship to that asset and make a case. Uh, I can't tell you across the board that we're doing that everywhere because well, some places are only using the software that comes with the equipment and then again attaching that document to a work order. So um, I think there's a lot of value there. In my opinion, I'd like to see both. Uh, it's a lot more work, but I'd like to see both. I'd like to see us use the data inside of Maximo in relationship to the asset as well as the attached document. But yes, we are, for the short answer, in some places we're doing that and doing it very well. All right, great. Well, I'm going to take the screen back here from you. I've got a couple closing slides for us. But Dave, uh, just really great information, obviously sparked some good conversation there at the end. And uh, I know for me, I wrote down you know some really good, good points you made um, that, that are helpful to, you know, to me, and I think that we could all use even in our everyday life as well. Um, you know, especially the you know focus on problems worth solving. You know, we've all got a million of them. So, what are the ones that that really it'll make a difference if if we get them fixed? So, um, some really good good information that that really resonated. So I appreciate that. Um, so as we've mentioned a couple times throughout, um, you know, our website, uesystems.com, just a wealth of information, um, all of our past recorded webinars, including the one today, it'll be up in a couple of days, and as I said, I'll email everybody. But we've got uh, all kinds of info there, past presentations from our conferences, articles, so on and so forth. So, so take, a, take a look, and if, if there's something you're looking for that you just don't see, let us know, and maybe that's a, a great topic for a future webinar, um, and we'll make it happen. Um, just another way to kind of keep today's conversations going, um, please you know, go over to LinkedIn and, and check out our two uh, groups that we've got. We've got our Ultra Probe Users Group and our Reliable Asset World Group. 
great place to, to have some peer-to-peer -peer conversation, ask questions. We're on there, happy to answer questions, but we do find that sometimes the best answers obviously come from your peers that are, that are experiencing maybe the same, the same issues. Um, we're on Twitter, we've got our blog, so just you know, trying to find all different ways to, to, to be out there and providing information. And of course, again, one last plug, um, our two conferences are coming up in just a couple weeks now, uh, Reliable Asset World, so, so a conference completely dedicated to reliability, asset management. Um, we're looking forward to that, kind of our, our inaugural uh, event co-located with our 10th annual ultrasound world. So uh, we're looking forward to sharing ultrasound best practices, reliability best practices. It should just be a really great week. And it's in Clearwater, Florida, so you really just can't go wrong there. Um, so if anybody still has the potential of joining, please get in touch with us, and, and we'll help make sure that we can get you down there. Uh, and with that, I'll leave our contact information up in case you guys have questions. And uh, Dave, just one more time, a big thank you for taking the time today. We really appreciate it. We know you've got, you've got uh, work and, and data to be collecting and analyzing, so uh, we'll let you get back to it. And hope everybody has a great rest of the day, and uh, we'll see you all next month.